All right, Dan, thank you so much for the in invitation and uh, for the introduction there. Um, again, my name is Scott Countryman. I'm gonna go ahead and um, mute my video here so it doesn't distract people. Um, the, what we're gonna talk about today is using ocean-based renewable energy to regenerate coral reefs. Uh, I'll start out with a brief introduction, then I'll talk about our experiences in the field, move on to some of the challenges facing coral reefs, and then discuss the solutions that we've been working on with Dan and uh, independently through my NGO here in the Philippines. So um, it's also really great to be on, the, on board as a Mars consultant. It seems like for the last 10 years, my life has been really focused on a lot of the topics that are ideally aligned with Mars objectives. And so it's just perfect that uh, I get to collaborate with other people with expertise in renewable energy and marine transport. So 2012, I founded the non not-for-profit organization, the Coral Trial Conservancy. And it was really, for me, a realization that we're not gonna be losing just another five or 10% of marine biodiversity through my life. It's more likely we're gonna lose it all. And it, that came from a lifetime of ocean adventures from Micronesia to Central America, to New Zealand, to Brazil. I, I lived in different places around the world and I used to always wanna to go to places that nobody had ever been to before. I wanted to go to the wildest places. So. I had a really good baseline of what pristine reefs should look like and coral reefs should look like. And when I moved to the Philippines in 1999 to start one of the first call centers, um, I did get out on, on the water some and I just couldn't believe how degraded the environment was here in particular with the large you know, apex predators. And then over the course of founding two companies in Manila, I bought a big boat and, and spent two years circumnavigating the country from Papua New Guinea down to all the way up to, to Taiwan. And I saw horrible things. I mean, I, it, for, for the nine years we went cruising, I never once saw a patrol boat. I saw illegal fishing every day. We saw dynamite fishing. We saw you know, scenes of um, whether it's sea turtles or whale slaughters or all sorts of stuff. And I started to realize that um, if, if we didn't do something about it, if we didn't all take some personal responsibility to do what we could to save what's left of the marine environment, we were gonna lose it all. So that was the motivation before, behind the Coral Triangle Conservancy. And after all the research, trying to figure out what we could do to help, um, the conclusion was no take marine protected areas, specifically the NEOLI marine protected area. That stands for no take enforced, old, large, and isolated. And when you have all these five things together, you get a multiplier effect in uh, biomass biodiversity. So that was our strategy. And it wasn't just localized marine conservation by reducing overfishing. It's also a carbon capture uh, benefit for climate change. So that's something we'll talk a little bit later about how overfishing affects climate. And, and the slogan that a lot of marine scientists are using around the world right now, which is easy to remember is 30% by 2030. If we can take 30% of our coastlines and set them aside in managed marine areas, uh, the ocean will naturally have a chance to, to rebound. So we, we have probably 80% of our work is related to social programs, job creation and um, enforcement and other things related to people issues. But this presentation is focusing on regenerating and restocking coral reefs. So uh, this slide is particularly um, about our triple bottom line objectives for our programs. And, and the key things to point out here are maximizing repeatabilities of locals and minimum project costs. Because I've seen a lot of projects where, you know, it requires fancy equipment flown in from Germany and eight PhDs. And by the time they've just done the analysis on the project, they're already a million dollars into it. So we wanted to do things where it was really um, inexpensive and we could, we could replicate uh, the project with people with um, the right intentions, but maybe not the, 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 the the highest education levels. All right, so there are uh, three primary found founding objectives for um, corals. There is, it's easy to increase substrate availability for the coral or increase the amount of coral coverage or alter growing conditions. So those are the three objectives of coral, general 
objectives of coral restoration. And those can be further divided into structural, biological, and physical. Structural is again, just, you, it could be a, a sunken ship. It could be some reef balls you see in the middle picture there, or it could be a bunch of concrete blocks. And that's just basically providing substrate for, for coral, corals to settle on. Biological is um, increasing the number of corals without assuming that there's ample substrate. And this is the Moda lab. The picture on the right at the bottom is the Moda lab in Florida where they're micro fragmenting, where they're, they're cutting up massive corals into small pieces and then getting growth rates of approximately 25 times to outcrop back into the wild. And the last one, which I talked about was, was physical and that's physically altering the growing environment. And I'm gonna run a little video here. The little video that's running is me and one of the guys uh, building one of these uh, bio rock domes. And I, in 2012, I went to Gili Trawangan in, in Indonesia and attended the BioRock seminar training program, became a BioRock engineer uh, with the co-founder of the technology, Dr. Thomas Guerrero, who deserves a ton of credit for all of his per patience and perseverance in developing this technology. But uh, after that, I rushed back to the Philippines and I threw a couple, I made a couple domes, uh, came up with a building process where we could get the, the, the total time down, actually down to about 15 minutes and about $16 per structure. And um, we, we just threw them in a marina right next to the uh, purpose built boat that we had that was, had solar panels that could, could charge the, the reefs. And we were amazed with the results. Um, within six months, we could see massive growth. Within nine months, when these pictures were taken, we were experiencing growth rates in excess of 600% of natural. Um, we had a wide variety of coral fragments that we collected from the reefs nearby, and all of them seemed to be doing really well. The branching corals seemed to be growing much faster than the smooth, uh, the massive corals, the brain corals. We also noticed some um, natural settlement occurring. Uh, you know, these are corals that we didn't, fragments that we didn't put there, but were, but were naturally recruited. Um, some of the observations was that, uh, you know, we ran out of space very quickly. The, the corals crowded on top of each other. And this is very different than the motivations of somebody who cultures coral for export. I mean, we were doing this for conservation. We wanted things to look as natural as possible. We wanted our structures to be completely encrusted with coral and let kind of natural selection uh, play out on these reefs as, as corals battle for space. One of the other, a couple of the other problems, one was the coral, especially the, the branching corals would become top heavy. They were growing so fast and branching so much that the weight on top sometimes was too much for the base. So we, so pruning these Acropora back constantly uh, was actually good for uh, propagating the coral around the dome, but also uh, better for the longevity of the, of the colony, the original colony. And that uh, a point to bring up there is that, you know, if you're growing so fast here that it's important to add different DNA uh, of the same species or else you get basically just clones of your original um, uh, donor coral. If we turn the power off, we noticed that our structures would rust really quickly. And if we were in the middle of a bleaching period or we were near uh, bad quality water, whether it's siltation or other, uh, the corals either got sick or died. So we definitely saw an impact of the power when it was on versus when it was off. And we left the power in this, this location on 24 hours a day. And we did do some experiments on uh, altering power voltage and amperage and we, we got uh, until we got the perfect density. And that was again, about uh, six to eight watts, excuse me, six to eight volts per structure and uh, between eight and uh, 10 amps per, per structure. So I put this slide in because, you know, this is this video here is the electric mineral accretion process in action. What you're seeing there is uh, pure hydrogen bubbles streaming up from the the uh, the dome, which gave me this idea of, you know, if if it is emitting pure hydrogen, perhaps we could actually capture it. And it kind of reminds me of a rubber tree plantation where you know the plantation owners are scoring the trees and collecting the rubber sap. And if we could 
channel that hydrogen in a way and collect it on the surface. And we experimented a little bit with that, managed to fill up a garbage bag that floated up in the air. And then later on a, a small uh, weather balloon that actually could carry a GoPro camera. So this is very unsophisticated and we we're managing to, to capture uh, some of the electricity here. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving. So uh, after a while, we, our original concept was to be able to have this sort of hub and spoke concept where the nursery, where, where we did all the growing and that, that provides economies of scope and scale and you can have your operations all located in one area and it's less wires to run and less power uh, distribution, less voltage drop and, and energy loss. And then once the structures are grown, uh, we use these airlift bags, or in this case, it's uh, plastic drums, and we elevate them near the surface. And then we just tow them to the location where we want to do reef, uh, reconstruction, reef rehabilitation. Interesting thing is that the fish, uh, in this, this case, we were towing three domes in these pictures, but we've towed up to eight structures at a time at about one knot which is a perfect application for electric boats. You know, electric boats tend to have low speed and high torque. So at this time, uh, you know, we were able to, it took, a, it took a day to move them eight miles or half a day, but uh, we only lost about 20% of the coral and all the fish swam along with the structure. So we use different, different structures for different purposes. Domes are pretty universal, uh, but the wedges are good for breakwaters and they're more durable. And the tables are great for nurseries and shallow protected area. So we had to decide where we're gonna put all these things. So it, the mapping is a really key element to the whole process. And the analogy I like to use is how do you eat an elephant? It's basically one bite at a time. So we took the 69 kilometers, 400 and, or 44,000 hectares and broke it down into bite-sized pieces and then conducted individual snorkel, manta towing, scuba, reef check and as small as one meter seagrass transects in each location to figure out where we wanted to put our our structures. And then once we mapped out the entire 70 kilometers of coastline, we set aside areas for no take and other marine uses with buffer zones. And it, it's a bit of this is coral reef triage, meaning like we, we have to realize that some reefs are in areas next to uh, rivers and other things like that, and they're just not going to be able to be saved. And we had to focus on the areas that had the most potential and the, the best natural defenses already in place. So this is a little image of, uh, of basically how you, how you survey 70 kilometers of reef. We did this sometimes on scuba, sometimes just free diving, and then generated a 150 page master plan for the entire municipality. Uh, next is once we had our locations, we do our modified reef check. We collect our donor orphan, orphan uh, fragments, usually after a big storm, uh, which high probability of that they're gonna die uh, when they're no, no longer attached. So we were basically rescuing these guys and putting them on our structures, then weekly maintenance. And you know, very quickly, this is about a year's worth of growth. You can see we had this very dense limestone that, um, we started thinking about how maybe we might be able to use it for other things other than just substrate for growing coral. Another approach here was fish bombed reefs. So this is a, a rubble field uh, that had been decimated by fish bombing. And you can see that uh, with a little bit of steel mesh and some electric current um, within a year, this is actually three years later, we were able to stabilize about 185 meters over spread over about 2000 meters. So this is the lowest cost in terms of uh, materials of all of the coral reef restoration that we did. And a lot of this is natural growth that I, I wouldn't take credit for. But once we had stabilized these strips in between, um, the coral just sort of took over after that. Okay, so I mentioned fish bombing and that was a big problem because sometimes we're down there you know, transplanting uh, 10 square meters of coral, but we hear five or six fish bombs within a couple kilometers. And that's obviously very distressing when you're down underwater, but um, it's also the fact that if we really wanted to be net positive increased coral cover, we had to stop the bombs. So we worked with a company to deploy networks of sensors. And then we, through a, a combination of social programs and 
uh, patrols and um, working with local communities, we reduced that number from about 2,600 fish bombs per month to down to about 150, which is still unacceptable, but it, uh, it, it was progress. So this is how basically the hydrophone system works. It's, uh, it triangulates the location. I'm gonna hit a button here. You can, if you have your microphone turned up, you can hear the fish bomb. I'll play it again. And then after, after that, we could triangulate the location of the fish bomb, and then we can send out with GPS coordinates, we could send out a boat to kind of see what was going on. So there was a whole bunch of different off the shelf technologies that we use. This is a team that we assembled. We were, we were apprehending one illegal fishing boat every four hours of engine runtime because of the information, the intelligence that we would gather in advance. We knew where the illegal commercial fishing boats were gonna be. Um, we partnered up with the Philippine Navy SEALs and with M4 rifles and Gen 4 night vision goggles. We would board the boats in the middle of the night and basically apprehend them and, and take them in for uh, processing by BFAR. So we also work with NOAA to, uh, to gather satellite data for, for uh, illegal lights. And we found that just DJI drones were a great uh, tool for about $800 to not only do reef mapping, but also gather evidence from, uh, for illegal fishing. On top of that, we developed applications. In this case, it's a mobile app uh, for your smartphone for fishermen so they can sell their fish uh, directly. So once they catch the fish, they could uh, just jump on their smartphone, they take a picture of it, it immediately goes up to the auction site and they could make uh, almost double the amount because normally the middleman was taking most of the money. They also could let them know that they weren't fishing that day and they could open up their boat up to become a water taxi. So like an Uber service, they could ferry uh, tourists around and they could make two to three times more money as a water taxi service than they would as a fisherman, which is great because that's less fishing pressure on the reefs. So all of these programs, you know, we, I, I don't have enough time to go through 20 other programs that we did, but we decided that in order to scale this and to be mobile and to be able to take these solutions to other places, we needed to put it all in one box. And so we bought a 20, a 40 foot container and cut it in half and, and made this mobile command and control center that was connected to, had its own comms, had its own solar power, made its own water, could house uh, four of our staff at a time for as barracks. And it was our community engagement facility for um, building community reefs and outreach programs to help educate people about uh, coral reefs. So those are sort of a lot of the positive things that were accomplished in the five-year program in Isugbu. And again, I won't, I'm not going to talk about the other programs. I'm just focusing on, on just this one because of time restraints. But here are the sort of the downsides. And the bottom line is that climate change and the assumptions of warming seas and uh, higher acidity uh, nothing changed in those, actually the eight years. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions continue to go up, the tap was still on, and without solving that problem, uh, a lot of the work we're doing is an act of hubris in the sense that it may not make any difference in 20 years. Um, there's tons of really great scientific work that's being done, but our organization is more interested in low cost, highly scalable solutions uh, that can be deployed uh, very easily. So the as soon as our funds ran out for monitoring illegal fishing, uh, it was just a matter of months before it was happening again. We noticed uh, increased land development, which was resulting in erosion that was smothering the reefs and silt. And there was just nothing changed with the funding. There was no money available from the local government and it was increasingly difficult to win grants. And so we basically just lived off small donations and volunteer work. Um, whenever I had a chance, I went out to groups and I, I promoted uh, that we need to take urgent action on climate change and, and repeated that we're basically facing a, a extinction level event for coral reefs, but it's not too late. And we, we know that the Neoli MPAs are great for uh, rehabilitating marine ecosystems. We can now measure the fish bombs and, and within months, if not year, uh, short years, we can eliminate the practice entirely. And again, some of our locations in around the Philippines were getting up to 500 fish bombs a day within 24 uh, kilometers from the sensors. So it's, it's a major, major, major problem. And, it, and there was a choice of spending money on planting coral or stopping fish bombing. And, and if we want to have bigger impact, it was really the stopping the fish bombing. 
Uh, we've shown that we can rapidly grow climate change resistant coral. And I always like to promote, uh, instead of electric vehicles, uh, electric vessels are the future to decarbonize the mar marine transport. But, it, but in those last eight years, the, the messages got even worse. Um, some of the key, just a, just a couple headlines here. One is that the discovery that corals prefer micro, eating microplastics than they do their natural food. And that's pretty distressing given the, given the amount of micro uh, five, uh, particles that are now plastics that are inside our environment. The second one here is that it turns out that plastic is an excellent uh, transmitter of the diseases that coral reefs typically encounter. Um, and some of these are, are human diseases as well. And so in sewer outlets that are going into rivers, those pathogens are going down the rivers and ending up on reefs, which are inundated with plastic. And then that plastic floats around and it, it spreads the disease. So as, as high as those reefs with 89, those reefs inundated with plastic had an 89% higher probability of being uh, infected with coral reef diseases. And then you can add paint chips and microfibers from textiles. And, and those are, again, whole subject matters that you could spend a day talking about. So now we're all, we're all talking about COVID, but clearly the larger wave on the horizons and challenges that we're gonna to have to face is the post COVID recession, then increasing impacts of climate change. And then finally, the collapse of entire ecosystems. So the original question is, can we really grow coral reefs faster than we're killing them? And their answer is yes. And not just in limited quantities and laboratories, but using a combination of techniques with five times growth rates for branching corals and 25 times, uh, up to 25 times for massive. And you know, a couple of quick points to mention in these slides is that you know, rising sea levels aren't equal all over the world for a number of reasons with higher ocean temperatures around ADB member countries, uh, it's up to five times higher uh, in around this part of the world, as opposed to some areas where actually sea levels are going down slightly. And with, with coral reefs uh, absorbing as much as 97% of the wave energy at the reef crest, you can see that there has to be, uh, there should be a solution to um, continue to grow corals or find a better substitute to reduce coastal damage from wave action. So we have the two main problems from my experience in the last 10 years uh, looking for a solution is basically population, people, population density. And you can see all the root causes there from nutrient pollution down to overfishing. Uh, on the far left, there's an analysis done by Enric Salas about uh, the, the health of coral reefs the closer you get to population centers. And recent reports that a lot of tropical species may have to migrate north or south to get away from the equator or go extinct. So again, back to the technology. It's, a proven, it's been proven 40 years ago in offshore gas platforms uh, of, of growing calcium carbonate using electricity. And in the places where they've installed these by rocks, they found out that not only do they uh, help restore eroded beaches from rising sea, sea level, but I was just on the phone last week with uh, Delphine Rob over at um, Gila Ecotrust and where they documented 100% survival rate on um, after the most recent bleaching events down there uh, on the Bayrock reefs with 24 hour power where they had a 60% mortality on the control reefs nearby. So not only are these able to rapidly grow corals, they actually make the corals somewhat resilient or in this case, very resilient to bleaching and warmer oceans. And when you look at the commercial applications of this, besides just growing coral, you know, the target is the $1.2 trillion concrete industry or the $682 billion a year cement industry. And each one of these little blue blobs here are a, a, a vertical that may be worth a several billion dollars. So our idea is this intercrop strategy of of regrowing coral reefs, but then having commercial products intermingled within those reefs where you could uh, harvest a percentage of the commercial products and then transplant the corals back into the wild and then move down the, move down the coastline and do kilometer after kilometer. We looked a little bit at the, at the prices of various uh, limestone commercial products and the, this cost assumes diesel power generation, but with 
marine renewable energy, you can bring the prices down, you know, sub 10, 10 US cents per kilowatt hour. And then even things like limestone blocks and, and commodity items like slabs become target uh, products. So the other application uh, uh, for, for monetizing coral reefs is uh, cultured corals for export. And last week we heard from Tom in Palau about cultural fish and corals. And he gave some ideas of how to regenerate coral reefs and generate money by exporting one third and putting two thirds back onto the reef. And so with that same business model, this is a, an area that we're looking at in, in one of the ADB member countries where from, the, from one direction you have strong current that's upwelling from about 600 meters depth. So it's nice and cold and oxygen rich. And then from the other end, you have a prevailing uh, long period swell. So you've got both tidal current being concentrated in this channel, and you have potential wind and wave energy coming from the other side, and natural protection from this small island. So in this case, each one of these squares represents a, um, a two hectare reef nursery with approximately 1,000 of these 10 meter diameter domes or 10 meter surface area domes. And based on that, it would consume about 50 kilowatts an hour or about 1200 kilowatt hours per day. Um, so it, just to use a, an example on electricity, that's about $43,000 a year just for your electricity bill. But then when you look at some of the revenues, uh, culture grown corals, assuming that only one third are exported and two thirds are going to other areas in the, in the region or around the region, but within probably five, eight miles of this nursery uh, where we can, outcrop them back to the wild to help wild reefs. That's 3.5 million annually. And I put these pictures in here because this is the actual location. You can see that there is no big ugly factory. You know, there, if, with, if we're using underwater tidal turbines in particular, there'll be nothing visible on the surface but a couple mooring buoys. And so you're not destroying the natural beauty of this place. So it, it remains a really attractive place for ecotourism. Um, also add in the finished limestone slabs and perhaps even the cultured fish products. And you know, you're looking at maybe five, six million dollars a year in revenue, which is more than enough to cover your electricity costs for, for growing coral. In terms of scalability, uh, Dan did this slide that shows about five, 50 gigatons of, of carbon and what it would take. And essentially, if we took about, um, uh, it, it would take accumulatively it looks like about 8% of the, of the coastline to sequester 50 gigatons uh, of carbon, which is more or less one year's uh, carbon emissions on the planet. So the, the energy numbers are huge, but you know, we're scaling it down to what would it be to do a billion tons? And that actually starts to look like in the, the realm of possibility. So another growing technique that we did was this uh, idea of suspended midwater reefs. So when, when I, when you get the reefs up off the ground, they have um, better water circulation, better oxygen, um, less pathogens, less predators that are, that are getting after them. And we took that one step further. Instead of being a half a meter off the ground, we actually started using these um, positive buoyancy reefs where we can control the depth of the reef in any, in any location. So in a hundred feet of water is probably too deep for most corals, but by putting a five eighths chain and, and screwing it into the sand bottom, we could have our reef just two or three meters under the surface, or we could let it all the way down to the bottom if a typhoon was coming. And we had some great learning experiences with that. We're currently designing our version 2.0 at Reefs for Life in B. Cole right now. And it opens up the possibility of these mega structures where it's just a matter of energy, like how much electricity do you need? And I grew up in the kelp, forests of California and there's something special about swimming in and under uh, reefs like this where you'd have light poking through and the biomass that would accumulate in channels with you know dozens of these large midwater structures as fish aggregation devices would be an awesome tourist attraction. So another application for the technology is breakwaters. So Dan did a bit of analysis here on the sweet spot for unit cost for breakwaters. And you know, breakwaters typically will dump hundreds of thousands of tons of cement blocks. And that obviously creates havoc with the marine environment. And our proposal is to use uh, energy from tidal turbines to slowly grow living reefs. 
which are natural breakwaters. We can even design the breakwaters in such a way that water as it, as it exits during high tide or low tide uh, concentrates the energy in places to provide better coral growth. And then why stop there? I mean, we can go to this idea of floating self-healing ferro-cement structures. And you know, here I've, I'm a surfer and I have put the little surfer images in here, but um, you know, by, if, if the current direction is, <clears throat> is, is down the middle of this uh, <clears throat> V-shaped structure, what you'd have is a natural collector of ocean plastics would accumulate in this V. And then as the current passed through the middle here, it would, it would slow the, the, the wave, waves down and create refraction around a single point at the apex here and, and concentrate wave energy. And I know a bit about wave energy because I, I had this 114 foot yacht that I circumnavigated the Philippines twice and went around all of Southeast Asia in. And we, in 2003 and four, we were on the cover of four international surfing magazines and 14 features, you know, promoting the Philippines as a new surfing spot. And that promotion resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars in tourism revenue, revenue for the Philippines uh, over, the, over the last uh, 10 years. And also it helped us discover over 200 spots up and down the East Coast where potential wave energy projects would make most sense. Just, just don't put them where we're, we're surfing our waves. Uh, another- Scott, you're at about 30 minutes now. Okay, I got, I think two slides left. Um, so uh, the other concepts here are, you know, after COVID, the tourism industry is gonna be reopening again. And this concept of negative carbon tourism where sustainability is not enough. And that not only should these resorts uh, be able to sequester all their carbon from operation, we're suggesting, and we have a project in, in Palau, which actually the, uh, excuse me, Palawan, where all the lifetime carbon of guests will be sequestered. So for any time you go there, your entire lifetime carbon will be wiped out after being a guest in that location. And, and this is a big issue because Europeans, this article in particular shows that people are going to be flying less because of their concern about their carbon footprint. So if we can get people to, to fly to uh, wipe out their carbon footprint for life, that is a big motivation to justify the travel. And I believe this is the last slide, but uh, we're, we, as we're approaching a, a, an extinction level event for corals in the next couple decades, we need to start thinking about now how to create uh, closed environments where entire coral reef ecosystems can persist in, in these biodiversity arcs. Uh, and so the idea is to identify one of, or, or several of tens of thousands of coral reef atolls across ADB member countries, and then pump deep water, cold deep water and control the temperature and acidity of the water in these. So I just don't think aquariums or some people have even suggested shipping containers where they, they try to keep these species alive while they go extinct in the wild. I think we need to create better growing environments in the wild. And there's a couple articles here that talk about, again, how scientists see these remote areas away from people as a potential life support uh, measure to give uh, maybe another 10 or 20 years to coral reefs before we can figure out what to do about climate change and sequestering carbon. So again, last slide is in the course of uh, this Mars TA and, and also my 10 years of experience on the ocean building electric boats, I see multiple use cases for renewable energy in the oceans. And this is just a short list, but I. I could probably add two more pages. Of, and, the, and the thing that, that I think is most interesting is, is that access to energy enables alternative livelihoods. And 90% of the people that we run across on these small island communities are subsistence fishermen. And if we can reduce the fishing pressure on the coral reefs by giving them better quality of life and higher paying jobs and food security, that is in itself uh, an excellent argument for uh, renewable energy mini grids on these remote islands where the corals are growing. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Scott. This is a really fascinating 
presentation and some some of this I know I hope I hope that this was illuminating for for most of our audience. Um, I'm still learning more about this as we as we go along as well. Um, there were a, a couple of questions that that popped up and I, I I tried to reply. I'm not sure if everyone get it. One Scott, one question was: Are there some sites to visit in the Philippines? And possibility for volunteering on, you know, doing doing work on some of these. Um, yes, there are, and I can say there's some affiliate sites that we've been mentoring and providing consulting to that I would recommend highly. Um, if you're right now, the Batangas projects are on hold mainly from COVID, but out in Bicol and Carmoan, I know that Reefs for Life uh, are doing an amazing job out there. They have hundreds of volunteers. They've got some. 37 hectares of marine protected area. They're uh, actively involved in the BioRock technology. And if you have skills uh, in particular, uh, whether it's accounting skills or building skills or engineering skills, um, you look, look, go to Reefs for Life on Facebook and reach out to Brian and Jacinda and send your resume. Otherwise, if you want, once tourism opens again, you can go to Gili Truangan, and they have a, about an $800 course uh, with uh, Delphine out there. And she, she does an amazing job. And she'll tell you basically everything you need to know about electric mineral accretion and, and get you started out there uh, helping out and volunteering on their programs. And then there's, you know, I don't, if, if it's not those two, there are hundreds of marine organizations that aren't using this technology that would benefit from volunteers. It's just sad that we have to rely on volunteers instead of having the cash to be able to pay market salaries to attract the best people in the world with the best skills. Dan, any other questions? Yes, another question was about um, the, the impact that you mentioned this extinction level event uh, scenario, which actually is not a scenario, it's, it's science, but what, what would the impact be on uh, Philippines traditional oyster pearl cultivation? Okay, um, well, the first thing that comes to mind is ocean acidification. And right now in the Pacific Northwest up in Oregon and other places the, they've already had to close a lot of their shellfish fisheries just because the water has become too acidic. And, and so again, we haven't seen a lot of that problem facing the Philippines yet. I mean, in fact, I think because of the way the currents are here, that'll be one of the last locations in the world that are gonna be affected or not one of the first, but certainly it's something to worry about. Um, one of the advantage again of the electric mineral accretion is the possibility, uh, we did do water uh, quality measurements around the domes and we found that they were higher oxygen content and higher alkalinity. So, the good news is that a lot of times in coastal areas, there's too much nutrients in the water, which is depleting oxygen. And then as well as higher than average temperatures have less oxygen. So these, these coral reef domes on electricity are actually um, gathering areas for fish because they're looking for oxygen. And the corals can form their skeletons much easier because of the higher alkalinity and they're saving energy uh, building their skeletons. So they're not having to um, they're not, uh, they're not, so they have that extra energy to fight disease and other, other issues, other predators and things. So I think there's a, there is a, a great story to tell about how the technology makes coral reefs climate change re resilient. And, uh, let's see. Okay. People are asking about getting copies of the slides. We're definitely going to figure that out. Steve posted a link where the presentation will be up in a, in a few days. Uh, okay, Alex Burrell is asking, are there power projects around Batangas engaged in reef protection projects using their own power generation? As far as I know, um, well, uh, us, I mean, we had, we had uh, uh, the, the Amanta, the solar catamaran that it could charge up to 150 structures at a time. And then we built smaller versions of that that were anywhere from 15 to 18. But I gotta tell you, I don't think that's the approach that's sustainable in the long run. It's just so much extra effort to drive out there and plug it in every day. And you have to have staff on the boat to watch it. And so I think the idea of ocean-based renewable energy that is um, 
less maintenance and basically just stays there and a couple times a year you have to check. I know that the Kalaka power plant in Batangas, for example, I mean, they have uh, megawatts of electricity at off peak that could be used for um, growing structures. And we approached them with proposals and never got a response. In fact, um, the, the possibility of growing shellfish rapidly because electric mineral accretion doesn't work for just corals. It's great for growing shells and it also works for um, um, mangroves. It enhances growth on and other um, marine organisms. So the idea would be is that we filter water from the, the coal dust at the Kalaka power plant and we're cleaning the water and at the same time building all these structures which then could be moved around to Anilao or Kalatakan or other places where um, coral reefs have been damaged by storms or, or fish bombing or um, anchor damage. Uh, I would just add to that, responding to Alex's question, uh, you know, if the power plant owners, especially the fossil fuel power plants, and I believe that's what you're referring to there around Batangas, we've got coal and natural gas. You know, if they wanted to do something good, uh, they could divert a little bit of their electricity to a cultivated reef using this you know, the, the system that Scott's described, this, you know, electrolytic mineral accretion system. This could be done as a, as a, you know, social corporate responsibility project to start off with. But, you know, what Scott outlined is that the, this uh, could be, could be commercialized here. You know, the, the, the big issue, one of the big issues we're trying to address in the Maris Technical Assistance Program is, you know, we look at ocean health and the traditional response, you know, this traditional approach to trying to do ocean, you know, marine conservation and environmental management is that you, you, nothing's commercial and it has to be funded by grants. Well, I got, you know, I got bad news. You know, there's not enough grant money to save the oceans. So if we, if, if we're going to save the ocean, which is, necessary to save the planet, we have to figure out how to commercialize ac activities like this. There's, there's no reason why governments should not be putting in money for marine protected areas. There's no reason why governments should not be paying to go after illegal and unlicensed and unregulated fishing. It's not that much money. We're not talking about you know, 10% of GDP. We're talking about 0.1% of GDP or, or one of the poorest countries would, would pay for this. Um, so, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, my, my suggestion to those power plant operators is that the budget, uh, a CSR budget from one of those power plant owners could be used to, to get started with the idea that this could become a commercial operation through marine aquaculture, tourism, sustainable building materials. Now, as Scott, I see someone's, someone's posted here, sorry, that um, uh, about foreign owned power projects, Korean TEPCO. Um, yeah, well, Scott has, Scott has approached, Scott has approached these power plant owners. Now, my, my observation is that, you know, the, the power plant owners don't don't really care. Exactly. Uh, you know, I mean, there's you know, there, there's nothing secret about this, um, and not not to drone on here, you know. But last year, I had a discussion with one of our colleagues, Tamor Nabili, uh, who some of you may may know. Um, he he and I were talking about this, and he said, "Well, you know, angel investors would want to do this, and." and you know, venture capital, this and that. I, I, I said, you know, Tamor, these reef in, the, the reefs that Garo and Hilbert started in Indonesia have been there since 2007. You know, angel investors have had more than 10 years to find these. If, if people were actually interested in the ocean in helping save the ocean, it's easy to, to find this. Um, 
So, but Scott, I'll let you continue that line there. <laughs> well, I think I think it's about ecosystem services that we take for granted from the ocean, and nobody really wants to pay for something that they've been getting uh, for free for for generations. And it's not until all the fish are gone and the coral are dead and all the valuable coastal protection from mangroves and reefs are gone that we'll really start to realize, oh shit, we should have uh, spent a little bit of money to protect those ecosystems because now we've got to build breakwaters. Now we have to, you know, eat bugs because there's no more fish left. Um, I, you know, I was very against the uh, ex wildlife extraction business and for export, the aquarium trade. And I still am against the wild uh, caught uh, a, a aquarium trade, but you know I really have gone come 180 degrees on the idea of using a small percentage or a minority percentage of your uh, cultivated fish for export to help fund the reintroduction of species back into the wild. I, there's just so few ways to fund these programs that this is a commercial model that. I think could could really help uh, fund the work that needs to be done and the enforcement that government is just not getting done. You, you see stories again now and then of you know BFAR catches this boat or catches that boat, and I give them credit for those. But like I said, we were we we would sometimes get 12, 14 illegal boats per night. We did patrols from Batangas all the way down to northern Palawan, and it, it was like you could just shine your flashlight in any direction. And uh, there's another, there's a hookah boat, there's a dynamite fisherman, over here's a trawler, over here's a, and it was, um, it was just so rampant that uh, we didn't even, we couldn't even know where to start sometimes. So, so if you don't get that in check, uh, it's gonna be bad news for marine life in general. And so this is, again, this idea of, if we wanna preserve coral reefs and we wanna try to keep them as intact ecosystems, we need to get as far away from people as possible. We need to work with countries like Palau that are doing much more um, and taking their conservation much more seriously and investing the resources that need to be invested. Because un unfortunately, the Philippines is one of the most underfunded and understaffed of all ASEAN countries when it comes to wildlife uh, preservation in, in national parks and marine parks. It's like five to one uh, below the next, the next one. Okay, we've got another question. Uh, how will you deal with offshore mining operations that have been cleared by the authorities? How will this impact your projects? Okay, it won't. I don't see it impacting our projects much because, again, they're operating in deeper water, somewhat offshore. But uh, my personal opinion about it is it's horrible. And um, if left unregulated, which it probably will be unregulated, out of sight, out of mind. There are entire ecosystems down there that we haven't even discovered yet that are now going to go extinct because of uh, basically strip mining. They're done with the forest. They're done with the coral reefs. Now let's go to the next untouched ecosystem, the Arctic and the deep sea mining. Um, I know that there's an area up by Apari in northern Philippines, which has now been permitted by DNR, the organization that's supposed to be defending uh, the environment. Uh, that's a whale migration area that'll affect uh, the local fishing there. And the way it's done is so, uh, it's like trawling. It's just bycatch, you know, they'll, they're gonna drag these huge nets along the bottom to get uh, mag manganese nodules. And there's gonna be a huge sediment plume and that entire ecosystem is gonna be wrecked. And, you know, I think there is a way to do deep sea mining using drones with robotic arms and, and uh, face recognition like technology to, to literally hand pick these nodules up, but it's a lot more expensive. And I don't think that the crony capitalists that are controlling things uh, want to do it the right way. They wanna do it the way that makes the most money. And, you know, based on mining and, and fishing in this country, they probably won't ha face any uh, negative repercussions for any illegal activity or earth wrecking activity. Um, well, there's a, uh... Just following up on this mining, instead of instead of just traditional digging up, you know, blast, you know, drill and blast, is you know, strip mining on the on the seafloor, uh, and pretending that it's not causing any harm. The electrolytic mineral accretion system 
there are there is potential to grow other kinds of minerals other than calcium carbonate, right, Scott? Right, and it's not only um, on the Kalaka power plant, for example, the coal fired power plant. There were heavy metals, uh, lead, ar arsenic, even um, detectable levels of radiation that were going from the coal into the water, which then goes into the food supply, which is making the people there sick. And the, one of the opportunities here is the, um, the shells of the bivalves of the, of the mussels. Um, you're using the meat or the animal inside to filter these, these pathogens and these heavy metals out of the water, but they're stored in their shell. And then what you can do is grind up the shell and put it in a centrifuge and you can extract nickel gold uh, from the shell. So there's a lot of gold in seawater. There's a lot of lithium in seawater. And um, it's one way of uh, monetizing this is actually to, to grind up the shells. You can use the meat. I don't know if I'd wanna eat it, but supposedly if you put them in fresh water for a week, um, they're fine for human consumption, but you may wanna use them for fertilizer or something like that instead. Um, but there are natural ways of filtering the ocean and growing reefs. Uh, but in the end of the day, I'd like to see the coal fire power plants shut down. I'd like to see complete movement to renewable energy. So it doesn't surprise me that the coal fire power plants don't want to participate in anything that helps the environment. I will say that some of the oil companies, Malampayan, the Shell Corporation, they have spent some of their CSR money on some good projects. But again, it's kind of greenwashing. It's all greenwashing in my opinion. What about, let's see, uh, Scott, I mean, I went, you know, I posted in the chat box as you were talking that, you know, the, the discovery of this electrolytic system was made by, um, by Hilberts, was yeah. on offshore oil and gas rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Uh, so. Question? Well, just a, just a comment, I mean, yeah, the, you're right. The oil and gas companies today are mainly greenwashing, like most other big companies are. Um, but right, they can be is, part of the solution, right? And they are transitioning and they are trying to do, some of them are trying to do the right thing. And um, certainly offshore rigs, uh, we've talked about this extensively at Mars. Of, you know, you got thousands of decommissioned offshore rigs, which are basically oases of life. And after being de decommissioned, there's a liability there where they have to spend tens, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to break them up and ship them off to the scrapyard or turn them over to uh, countries to be sanctuaries and these sort of, uh, again, arcs for biodiversity for coral reefs and uh, marine aquaculture, unpossible renewable energy production. So yeah, maybe taking something bad and making something good out of it, I'm, I'm all for that. Well, that's going to be the topic for another uh, presentation later this year in the, in the Mara's web webinar series. Um, we've, we've got a couple more minutes here. If there are, if there are any other, other questions, we've got three minutes left. Um, Yeah, come on. I'd like to. I, I'm I'm eager to answer some more questions. Anybody? Uh, no, no takers. People, you must have. Yeah, there. Hey, go back there for a sec. The with the hydrogen bubbling off. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, we've also you know, there's a lot of talk a lot of buzz these days about green hydrogen and doing offshore wind to make green hydrogen. Uh, you know, what Scott's showing here, that the, that's not CO2 coming off. That's not carbon dioxide bubbling off. That's hydrogen. And this, this uh, electrolytic system, the current and the voltage that are set, that are required to grow calcium carbonate is almost exactly the same as the current and voltage for electrolyzing water to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. So the you know one concept here is that, and we're talking about this specifically in the Mares TA, is you know that we we can go offshore and do large scale offshore renewable energy, gigawatt scale uh, renewable energy offshore. There we go. There's the 
part of, part of the reaction sequence. Uh, and we could be, we, could, we would electrolyze water to make hydrogen. Now, those, those offshore structures, we know from the experience in the Gulf of Mexico and offshore California and other, other parts of the world that marine life will start to grow on those, on those offshore structures. So as Scott has explained, we know how to cultivate that. We can encourage that. And so we, we, we can create a brand of regenerative green hydrogen. Uh, so Scott, give you, give you one minute to, to wrap up. Well, yeah. well, so two things on that is, is you, you look at, um, well, I mean, corals benefit from this increase in pH at the surface of accreted materials, and that alleviates the impact of global warming. So the availability of alkalinity, had, it, it appears to increase coral skeleton growth, and meaning that less coral metabolic energy is needed for proton and calcium pumping. So that leaves an extra uh, energy for growth, reproduction, resisting environmental stresses. And so, so that, that's kind of what's going on in, the, in that, that video there. And you know, we, we talked about other uh, uses for offshore energy and not only the production, we talked about production of hydrogen and using ocean renewable energy. And I think Michael by talking a little bit about that, but these, these oil rigs, uh, these offshore gas rigs have pipelines back to shore and using the existing pipelines to move hydrogen uh, is, is a possibility. Um, also the other idea that we came up with was using these platforms and the renewable energy. If you can generate 20 megawatts of, uh, of renewables from a combination of wind, solar, current, uh, you know, that, that could be two, three million dollars, uh, I'm sorry, 20 million dollars a month in revenues from crypto mining. I mean, and that's one of the big issues right now with, with crypto is that the Bitcoin's destroying the world. It's causing greenhouse gas emissions. If you could buy your crypto with energy that was 100% renewable for the, the creation of the currency for the mining of that, of that currency, I know that artists selling NFTs would be would feel a lot better knowing that their crypto isn't actually contributing to greenhouse gas. So there's there's a there's a niche, a growing market for renewable energy for the production, uh, the mining of crypto, and that could be done all offshore with a with a Starlink connection. Okay, um, with that we're we're out of time, and there's another webinar that ADB is hosting that's starting. So I, I think some people might want to want to log off and go over to the other one. So thank, thank you very much, Scott. This has been really great. I, we've got some positive feedback from our, some of our audience, at least. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And um, this is a topic that we can come back to later in the year or early next year on the Mars TA and, and go into more, more detail. Uh, great. Thanks again, everyone. Sure. Feel free to email me. Also, if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, you can email me at scott at ree.ph, ree.ph, like reef with a ph. And uh, you can email me any questions or comments directly. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.